or delete even, and the insert is, in the case of an insert, you're starting with a blank form that you have to fill in everything for, whereas with a uh, update and a delete, you want to show the values that are, are, are already there. Therefore, the first thing that we're going to look at is doing a query where we do a query that is not necessarily attached to a visual control. And we're going to go and do that attaching ourselves. In other words, any of the queries that we've done before, we've done in association with a details view or a grid view. Now we're going to do it, and we're just going to do it, we're going to get the results, and we're going to go and format the page the way we want to. Uh, the downside of it is it's more work. The upside of it is you then have complete control to get it to work just exactly how you want to. So, I believe this is what we were looking at last time. We looked through exceptions uh, and all. I think we did it for the student, though. This time we're going to do it for faculty because we want to show, among other things, how to make an image um, that would be based on uh, that. And, and we can do a, f a few other things as well. We, we can play around with this. But again, our theme here is that we're going to be doing the coding ourselves as opposed to using the built-in controls to do it. Yeah, it, it, it's just, it's, you, can you use a building control? Absolutely. Um, if I don't specify how to do it, if I don't explicitly say do it this way, um, then, um, you know, it's up to you. Um, again, you know how the grid view and details view work, and you've seen examples of those. Um, Part of it is judgment to look at, especially when it comes to your project. What's the best way maybe that we could go and do that? I'll give you, for instance, when I would likely use a, a, custom, uh, a, uh, a custom form as opposed to a, a, a grid view or a details view. All right. Let's say, for example, I wanted to add to my Netflix queue. All right. <laughs> What would my what how what, did, what would the table look like for my Netflix queue? It would probably look something like this. All right, you're all familiar with Netflix, even if you don't subscribe to it, right? You go you go in, you can get movies, and you can create a queue, and they'll send you DVDs in in the order of your queue, more or less. All right, the queue. The table for the queue would probably look something like this. It would probably be a queue ID, which would be a generated key, let's say. There will be your user ID. All right. There will be the movie ID. And there will be a priority. That's probably what your queue table will look like. All right. Now. The way Netflix works, if I felt like logging on, uh, I, I'd just go in and do it, but um, I'd probably see something interesting and put it up and would end up watching it and not getting to this stuff. But the way that it typically looks like is if you're searching for a movie, you know, you do a search and you, you look for Star Wars, let's say, and up comes, I'll draw a lightsaber here, up comes Star Wars. There's a button here that says add to queue. All right. So I can click that button and it will create an add statement. Now, or an insert statement. Now, where do you suppose it gets these pieces from? The queue ID, that's an auto number, right? Uh, you know, using access as terminology. Um, again, you know, I have no idea how they actually do it, but it's probably something like this. 
the user ID. Where's the user ID at? I didn't go and type anything in on this page to tell them what my user ID is. So where does it get your user ID from? Yeah, it remembers it, and that's one thing we haven't talked about in this class, but sort of giving sort of a preview of why you might do this custom. Your user ID, it probably remembers from the logon. All right. Um, the technique to do that is typically called a session variable. All right. The movie ID, where does it get it from? Where does it get the movie ID from? Yeah, well, not from the image, but from this page, right? Because probably the, qu the query string for this movie, if this was done in .NET, probably looks something like this. Right? So, or it could look something like that, where we pass on the query string the ID of the movie. So, the movie ID is probably going to come from the query string. And, where's the priority going to come from? Well, the way that it works by default is it puts it as the last entry on your queue. Alright? So in other words, if you have 10 movies, it gets put in, automatically it gets put in position 11. All right. Um, so the priority is actually based on how many movies are in your queue. Well, what's another way to say that? It's going to query the queue table to find the highest position and add one to it. All right? So, in other words, it's going to query, it's going to do a select max priority from queue where user ID equals my user ID. So if I have movies one, two, and three in there, it'll pull that my maximum one is, my, my maximum position is three. So it will go and add one to it and it will put the new movie in position four by default. Now, if you think about this, this kind of an insert doesn't really lend itself to a grid view or a details view, right? Because a grid view and details view is, is more or less based on here, here's a new person. I'm going to put in their name, their, their address, their phone number, where you manually fill in the values in a text box. Right? Here, we're not really filling in anything from a text box. We're getting everything from someplace else. We're getting everything from the code. So there's no real need even for a form here other than a button. Right? Uh, so what I would suggest in this case is in my mind, it would be a real pain to try to write this using a details view or a grid view. You could do it, certainly, but it'd be so much better just to write your own code. It's like, all right, I don't have to worry about the queue ID because that's auto number. All right, the user ID I have in a session variable. The movie ID I get from the query string of this page. And finally, the priority, well, I do a quick query to the database, find out how many items they have, add one to it, and bang, that's a priority. So this is a case that doesn't meet the neat um, format, the default behavior of uh, a details view or grid view. And again, remember, whenever you have sort of an unusual situation like that that doesn't fit the framework, you can either try to kind of tweak the framework uh, controls to make it work the way you want it to, or you can say, forget it. I'm, I'm going off. I'm going going off road here, and I'm going to just do it my own way. All right, and that gives you complete control, and you can write neat little code to do something like that. All right. So again, that's sort of my philosophy behind wanting to review this. Um, this is a classic case uh, of 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 wanting to do it this way. Um, all right. Let's look at 
what we had for the insert last time. I think the page I made was student add to. Or not. No, it was student add. All right. And what I had is I had a form with two text box and a drop down for faculty advisor. I created a SQL data source for the, the faculty member. And I went in and um, added a drop down that was, that was bound to that data source. When the click button is, is, is uh, when the button is clicked, I then go and do this code, which creates my SQL data source. Again, we've, seen, we've created SQL data sources before by going through the GUI and just dragging them on. All right? We want to know how to write code uh, against those without having to go and do that. So we've created our data source. We have set the two properties of the data source that determine what database we're connecting to. And that is the two properties that are stored in the connection string, namely the provider name and the connection string. We have to supply as an argument to that connection strings function the name of our connection string. And in this example, the name of our connection string was, cleverly enough, connection string. So if we look in the web config file, we'll see the name of my connection string is connection string. You'll notice there's two other properties for it. There's the actual connection string itself. And there's a provider name. Notice the connection string uses the data directory value as opposed to hard coding a value. That allows us to be a little more flexible as far as moving this application around. All right. So now we've created our SQL data source. We have pointed it at, pointed it at the right database. We come up with our insert command, which again, insert into student, and we have the three fields there. The first name, the last name, and the faculty ID. And the three values, of course, we don't know when we program this, right? We want to pull those values from the respective controls. So we put question marks there, all right? That's sort of a, a, a constant sort of thing. Anytime that you want the value uh, to be a parameter that's determined at runtime, we put a question mark. We do that with our queries. Um, and we're doing that with the insert here. We then go in and add our three parameters to say, gee, where do these question marks, where do these blanks get filled in with? Well, the first one gets filled in with the value of the text box called F name. Second one gets filled in with the value of the text box L name. The third one gets filled in with the drop down selected value. We then try a student insert, or try to insert, and if it succeeds, we redirect back to the list. If it fails, we catch any exception. All right. Chances are we're only going to get one kind of exception here, a, a DB exception. But uh, we're going to catch that, and we're going to display a, a little error message that says what to do. Questions on, on this one at all, on this example? All right. What I want to do now is I want to do a similar thing, except I want to change uh, faculty. Let's see if this one already does it or not. Oh, no. Nope. Sure. On all inserts, we only use one table, right? Yes. A table, uh, an insert only handles one table at a time. Not in one insert, you can't. No. You could do two inserts, one to insert into table A, one to insert into table B. Right. You cannot just do one insert for No. Right. For insert Correct. So for example, um, what would be an example of something that, that you would uh, have if you had, um, if you wanted to insert um, a student and insert the courses that they were taking, let's say. So maybe you had a form that had 
where you could put in the student, basic student information, and then you could insert the student, the courses associated with that. You would have to have insert into the student and then look at the drop downs for course or whatever, insert into the student uh, course drop down. So yeah, you can do it. You can write the code behind to do that, but, but physically an insert handles one table and one table only. All right. Right, right. What we would do is after, and we have to make sure that the uh, sequencing went correct, right? Because we would want to, you know, we would want to, uh, chances are there would be a foreign key in the course table, so we'd have to make sure the student was inserted first, and then we would go in and maybe insert into the course table. Something along those lines. Yep. All right. So let's go in and let's pull up the faculty information. Uh, and, and we'll do it um, uh, using code that we write as opposed to using um, the, uh, the built-in controls that are in the framework. All right. So let me go in and let's see what this page does. All right, this page, this page is a little faculty listing. I'm going to piggyback on top of this page. I'm going to go and add my page to this. And then I'm going to go and make this um, an edit link. And so what I will do is I'll go and edit this guy to say, I'll add a link field, a hyperlink field. I will make the text of that hyperlink field faculty edit, for lack of a better word. I'm not going to put a data field for the URL. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not going to put it for a data field for the text field because I'm just going to have the, I'll put that in the wrong place. Because I just want the word edit to be the text of the link. I don't want it to be the actual, an actual field from the, um, field from the, uh, the database. So what do I want? I want FID and I want Faculty list dot ASPX or faculty edit, I'm sorry, dot ASPX question mark ID equals curly bracket zero curly bracket. All right. Let's go and make sure that that's correct. I'm going to make this a start page and run this. And away we go. All right, so I go in and I search for faculty name. Um, let's 
see. Um, I think it, yeah, it's searching at the beginning of the name. So I search a B for Blanchard. If I notice this edit, I am calling the proper link because it says faculty edit dot ASPX question mark ID equals two. So I formed that link correctly. Now I just have to go and make the actual edit page. All right. So that's our next task. So I'm going to go in um, and stop debugging, create a new file. On a web form. I think we're using a master page here, so we'll say that. And I want my page to be called faculty edit.aspx. Use the master page, and we're off. Now, we're going to do a similar thing that we've done before, except we're going to do the work ourselves, right? There's always the, the data access component, the, the SQL data source, and there's always some sort of visual control. The difference being is that when you use a details view or grid view, you just work in sort of the big pieces. You create your, your uh, data source and you say, I'm going to hook it to the grid view. And then the grid view or the details view takes care of all the little, little, little details, like you know text boxes and labels and all that kind of stuff. Here, though, because we're doing it ourselves, there's still going to be the data source. There's still going to be the visual component. But in this case, it's going to be like lower level visual components, text boxes and that sort of thing that we ourselves put in, all right, and that we can go and uh, uh, we do the manual hooking those two together. So let's go in here and let's create a couple text boxes for. First name and last name. Again, I'm just going to start out very basic here. Start one with first name, one for last name. And I'll even put an image here so that we can create the image. All right? We had talked about doing that. We will even create a label so that we can create the image a second time, this time using a label, because that was mentioned how to do that. Remember, a label represents any block of text, and we can make that HTML just as well as we can make it anything else. So we'll go and do that. And then we'll go and we'll put a button on there so that we can go and submit it. All right. So now, the first thing I have to do, all right, and again, you know, do keep in mind that in these examples, I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily polishing them up. I'm not putting in the labels and, and changing the names and all that. All right, that's just in the interest of time. All right. Uh, now I want to go in and I want to write the code that is going to retrieve when I when this page loads. It's going to retrieve the information from the database and populate those fields. So, what I can do is I can do this. I can go into the code behind for this. Maybe. And I want to do this when the page first loads. So I will go create the page event and I'm going to do the page load event. All right. This is something I want to do right off the bat. Now, um, <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to put this line of code in here now, and we'll come back and talk about it later. Don't let me forget to talk about this. All right. It says if is postback is false. What's a postback? Right. In other words, typically these forms work in sort of multi passes. All right. Initially, you load the page. That's the first time you've loaded it. If you've loaded the page, done something on the page, and then pressed a button to have it submit back to itself, that's a postback. All right. And by saying if postback, if is postback equals false, Effectively, we're asking, is this the first time th through? 
We only want to execute this code the very first time through. All right? And we'll talk about why in, in a minute. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and I'm going to do similar to what I did with the add. Uh, I'm going to dim my data source. In fact, I'm just going to go and copy that code from the other one. This is where I feel like those TV chefs, you know, like they, they start to make something, then if, you know, they can say, and then two hours later you come back and here's your turkey, and they just pull out of the oven and it's complete, you know. So I can do the same thing sort of here, cut and paste and code. But again, I'm doing the same thing. And what these three lines do effectively is it creates a SQL data source and it points it at the right database by defining the provider name and the connection string associated with that. Uh, with that database. I then am going to select my, set my select command, which makes sense. If we remember the other example, remember the other example, the add, I set the insert command because I was inserting. Here I'm setting the select command because I'm, I'm doing a query. All right. And I'm going to say select um, FF name, FL name, faculty image from faculty where FID equals. What FID do we want? We don't know. It's going to be determined at runtime. Therefore, we put a question mark in. All right. So same idea as before. Well, the, the parameters that get filled in at runtime are represented by a question mark. But also same as before, I have to go in and say, well, how is that going to get filled in? So how is this one going to get filled in? How am I going to fill in the faculty ID from this uh, in this uh, select statement? Where am I going to get the where am I going to get the ID of the, the faculty person that I want to pull up? From the query string, right? Remember our link said faculty edit question mark FID equals. Does it say FID or did it say ID? Okay. I'll I'll start off with being FID and, and if I'm wrong, we'll 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 find out now, won't we? Alright. So I'm gonna add that parameter. And the value comes from the query string. Query string part of the request or response object? Is it coming from the client to the server or from the server to the client? It's coming from the client to the server. So it's part of the request object. And pretty sure it's FID. We'll stick with that and we'll see if that works. All right. Now, so far, this is just about the same as the code that we had for the add, other than the fact that we're doing the select things instead of the insert things, right? We have our select statement instead of the insert statement. We have our select parameters instead of the insert parameters. Here's where it deviates. And it deviates because, keep in mind, an insert, along with an update and delete, is either going to fail or not. Right? Or I guess that's a pessimistic way of saying it. It's either going to succeed or not. Right? Um, and if it succeeds, maybe there's a number of rows that get uh, influenced. Maybe that's another piece of data that can be returned. A select statement, however, can return a lot of data. Right? In other words, this particular select statement is only pulling up one faculty member. But I could just as well write a select statement that pulled up every faculty member. All right? And therefore, it's not just a matter of getting a simple response. Yes, it worked. No, it didn't. It's a matter of what is my result set? What is the data that I'm getting back from this query? All right? In other words, a select is different than an insert, update, and delete insofar as a select actually returns you the data that you asked for. Whereas another insert, update, and delete simply does its thing, tells you if it worked or not. All right? So, because of that, this is where the select sort of goes a little bit 
uh, in a different direction because we have to specify a few parameters about how we want the data returned to us. All right? And in our case, what we want to do is in this, you know, in this particular case, all we're doing is we're grabbing that data so that we can pull it out and put it in our form. So we're not doing anything um, extensive with it. We're not going forward and backwards and that kind of thing. We're not doing a lot of stuff for it. So we're going to take the simpler approach and we're going to use what's called a data reader to do that. So here's where I set the data reader. And I will say obj ds dot data source mode Oops. equals, and I have two options, a data reader and a data set. And the descriptions which are so um, thorough says that one returns it as a data reader, one returns it as a data set. It doesn't really tell you anything. Suffice it to say that the data reader is sort of the simplest. If you just want to grab some data, you know, use a data reader. If you want to do some more extensive things, like maybe you're going to loop through it and go forward and backward and so on, then maybe you'd make it a data set. So I define that. Then I have to create a place to put my results. And that's a variable I'm going to dim. I'm going to call it my reader as. I will post this example, so don't worry. Oops. Between me, you, and a lamppost, if you asked me to define exactly what this statement does, I could probably give a, a good guess. But I, I'm not convinced that I could explain exactly what each piece of it does. But, I can tell you in effect, what it does. This is creating a place to put your answer. All right? This is, is it put, uh, this is creating a, a data, you know, your, your result set. The result set associated with this select command uh, it puts in there and it puts it in the format of a data reader which means that we can just loop through it and we can't go forward and backward as we process it but we can loop through it from beginning to end. All right, Which is really if you're just reading it just to read it and you're not doing any sort of updates or anything that's probably what, what you want to do. All right, um, Again if you're really interested look at the difference between a data set and uh, a data reader but the data reader is a, is a simpler um, just run through sort of uh, thing. So, effectively what this does is this creates for us our result set. So my reader contains my result set. 
Now, what does a SQL result set look like? A SQL result set looks like a series of rows and columns, right? So, for example, if I were to say select FF name, FL name, faculty image from faculty, all right, nowhere clause to start, if I was just to do that, what would my result set look like? It would look like a table, right? It would have a column, FF name, FL name, faculty image. This doesn't appear in the data set, that's just our notation. In other words, if I were numbering these columns, using the notation we typically do with, with in programming where we number starting with zero, we have a column zero, a column one, and a column two. Now how do I know that FF name is column zero? Because that was the first thing in my SQL statement. How do I know FL name is column one? Because that was the first thing in there. So what our data set would look like would be or our data uh, uh, results that would look like would be that be a bunch of rows, a row zero, one, two, three, for however many faculty people there were. And in column zero would be the first faculty person's name. In column one would be the last name. And in column two would be the name of the image for that person. And in row one then would be another first name, another last name, name of the image, and so on down the line. All right? So that's what the result set looks like from a SQL query. All right? Now, that's effectively what we have in, uh, in uh, our, our my reader object, right? Because our my reader is my result set. Okay? So, what do we want to do? Effectively, well, let's back up for a second. Let's back up for a second. If my SQL statement could return a bunch of rows, what would I want to do? I would want to loop through, grab the first row, do something to it. Grab the second row, do something to it. Grab the third row, do something to it. Grab the fourth row, do something to it. Until I was all done. All right, so that's what I would want to do, all right, um, with this data set that's returned. I'd want to loop through, grab the first row, grab the second row, grab the third row, and so on. In this case, there'd be, real no, there'd be really no reason to jump around, right? It would be okay just to read them sequentially, all right? So, if I was returning a bunch of rows, I would write a little loop that would grab the first one, do something with it, grab the second one, do something with it, grab the third one, do something with it. But, what does our SQL statement look like? Our SQL statement has a parameter that has a WHERE clause that adds WHERE FID equals some parameter. What does that mean to my result set here? What's the implication of that to my result set? Yeah, I'm only getting one row in my result set. To be completely precise, I'm either going to get one row or zero rows. I could potentially get zero rows if somehow I, I messed up, you know, and I didn't pass the ID right, or somehow someone, you know, went in and typed something on the URL manually, you know, that would be a possibility to do, all right? Uh, I, I'm reading a web comic now, all right, and I know which number in the series I'm in. So if I'm on another computer, I just go in and I type that number up in the URL and I go right to the page, right? If I happen to, and, and again, I'm not malicious about that, it's just a nice little shortcut to jump to the panel that I want to. Um, you know, if, if someone did that 
not understanding how to construct a URL and put it in an invalid number, you'd want it to handle it gracefully and you'd want it to, to uh, error out in a certain way. All right, so the bottom line is, is with this particular query, we know by definition that there's only going to be at most one row in it. So we can forget about this. Which means we can also forget about the loop. All right, we don't really need to loop through. We can just look to see if there's something there. If there's something there, that's our guy, right? If there's not something there, then there's something wrong with the query. All right, so with all that in mind, all right, that this is what it's going to look like. We're going to have one row in our result set that's going to have three columns, a column zero, a column one, and a column two. We go back to our code and I say if my reader All right. What do you suppose that does? My reader dot read. Forget about the if statement for now. If I just if I just did that, go ahead. Is yeah, it's grabbing the next row in the result set. Now again, remember for everything I said over the last few minutes, there really is no first row, next row, next row, next row. There's only one row. So in this case, the next row is the only row. All right. If we had this, if we if we thought that we could have multiple rows in this uh, result set, we'd have that instruction in a loop. And each time through, it would read the next row in the loop. The first time I issued the my re reader.read command, it would read the first row in it. If I did it again, it would read the second row. If I did it again, it would, it would read the third row. For those of you that did some sort of old school programming, this would be like reading a sequential file, effectively. Because with a sequential file, every time you're doing a read, you're reading the next thing in line. All right? Same idea here. You know, that, uh, that, that uh, data reader effectively sort of makes a nice little sequential, uh, not really a file, but, but a sequential table of data that we can loop through and read through. Now, in this case, we're grabbing the one and only row in this, in this file. Now, what do you suppose the if statement comes in for? Well, what's the if statement do? Why do I have that in an if statement? Exactly. If it doesn't read anything, that if statement is going to be false. All right. So in other words, the my read, the, I'm sorry, the my reader dot read method is going to return either a true or a false. True means it got something. False means it didn't get anything. Now, in this case, that, this will be useful in telling us did we actually pull up someone with the appropriate ID? All right. Because if if that first read shows false, it means that there's no one out there with that ID number. That maybe someone did what I do, do and typed in the URL and typed it in wrong. Now in the case of other examples where we have a result set that has a bunch of rows, that read is going to be true each read until it hits the last one. Then when you try to do the next read after the last one, it will tell you false. So if, if, if let's say we really had four rows in here, would do a read, it would return true. Would do a read, it would return true. Would do a read, it would return true. Read, true. Read, nothing there, false. So that would be, again, using the old terminology like an end of file marker. That would indicate, hey, you've hit the end of the line. So if we were pulling up multiple uh, rows from a, a database, and we did the sequential read, would know when to stop when that function returned to false. Because that means, hey, no more. All right. So, I do the read, and then what I have is I have the data. And I can actually pull that data now into my form. So I can say, text box 1, dot text equals 
my data reader zero. Oh, my reader is zero. All right. What do you suppose that means? Where does the zero come in? Right, column zero, the first column. So the last name then would be in column one. Finally, the third column, if you remember, has an image. All right, we're pulling the image from there. So what we can do is we can say image one dot image URL equals images slash plus my reader all right so what does that mean we're grabbing my reader 2 that's column 3 of our result set we're tacking in front of that the word images slash that's the path to the image and then we're setting the image URL property to that so let's see if this works now keep in mind we haven't really done the update yet all we've really done is we've created uh, so that when we click on this link to go to this edit page all right we have um, the values uh, in our text boxes and all that so this is just going to do the reading part we're not doing the update part yet all right so let's take a look at this All right, I search for someone, search for Blanchard, click on edit, and drum roll please. I don't, I don't like when it takes this long. Ah, what happened? I... tells me a null reference object on this line. Dim my reader. Let's see. That means I probably created it wrong. So let's look at that line of code. Dim my reader as data I reader equals C type Telling me that it's null. All right. Here's a guess. Let's look at this. Ah, call it ID. All right. Not FID. I will bet that's it. So what do we do? We'll go here and we'll try, no, FID equals ID. Let's try this.
Okay. It worked, but it doesn't show any image. All right. We'll have to go and look to see why that is. But it did pull up uh, the name. How did I know that that was the, the problem? Um, I didn't. All right. I looked at the code and thought, what could have gone wrong here? These are my notes. I've used these notes every semester for the past several. Uh, and I thought, well, what could have gone wrong with it? And it's like the only thing I thought of is like, oh, I'll bet you that that's the piece that I got wrong. So that's how I knew that. If it didn't, what I was going to do is I was going to turn off my mic, pretend like I was experiencing technical difficulties, hold up a sign like they do on TV, you know, and uh, we would have said, well, you know, the lecture, second half of the lecture was canceled today. All right. So we did see why that's the case here. All right. Um, so, so that was, was the issue, apparently. Apparently, somehow, because that parameter wasn't valid on the query string, that something wasn't created correctly, and therefore it blew up. All right. Let's go and look at why my image isn't shown right. And let's do that, first of all, by looking at the code. A very underrated technique is to look at the source code that gets generated. All right? And in this case, the source code that gets generated, the image ID equals SRC equals images slash, well, guess what? I'm guessing Blanchard doesn't have an image defined for him in the database. Let's look in the database. Oh, looky there. Blanchard does not have there. Williams does and Brown does. All right. So let's pull one of those up to make sure it works. Then we'll talk about what we want to do for Blanchard and for other people that don't have images. So let's go in and let's pull up Brown. And there we go. Yay, we got this image. So how do you suppose you want to handle Blanchard? Pardon me? Yeah. Well, what we can do is because, again, this, this is where, uh, you know, there, there's, a, there's a piece of me that, that loves this approach of not using the built-in controls. Because I can do whatever I want, and I know exactly how to do it, and I can do it very easily. You know, I was I just I had a discussion yesterday about the iPad versus Android uh, tablets and the Android operating system. One thing I love about the Android platform is that, you know, <laughs> worse comes to worse, I can plug that thing into my computer, and it becomes a giant USB drive, and I can go in and do whatever I want. Now, that's frightening <laughs> to a lot of people, right? And that's exactly one of the main reasons why Apple has this audience, is that you don't have to do that. You, you, you know, it takes care of it for you. But remember, when someone or something takes care of things for you, it does it their way. And it might lock you down or restrict you to what you can and can't do. And, and so that's a big advantage to this sort of approach. That being said, there's something to be said about the convenience of plug and play, creating that, that, that data view or, or details view or grid view and just matching it up and you're ready to roll. So what I suppose what I would want to do would be something like this. I can look to see if if that equals an empty string, then I can do that, or not do that, I'm sorry. Oh, 
Otherwise, I can hard code, you know, some other sort of image. All right. Which, if you remember, is something similar that you could do with the control. So I could go in here and, ah, na.gif. There we go. I, 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 any of you watch the TV show Arrested Development? Perhaps? Oh, they were trying to describe how this one kid was so non-distinct that uh, underneath her picture in the yearbook it had the words not pictured. <laughs> But yeah, every, every time I do this example, I, I think of that. But now, let's go in and see it in action. There were build errors. Uh-oh. No. What'd I do? Yeah. I was uncomfortable about that. I think I don't have... I think I'm missing an end diff. All right, so now we go and search. Pull up Brown. His image pulls up. We pull up Edit or uh, Blanchard, and ah, okay, it's not an empty string; it's a null. So I can't say equal string. So I'd have to say if that equals. a better way to do it. I was thinking there was an empty string filled in the database. There was actually a null, which again is different than an empty string. So now we go and Brown displays his picture. Blanchard displays no picture available. Now the question of what if we wanted to go and, and put that in a label and not use the image control? I'm not sure why, but this is going to be a good jumping off point for another thought. Remember, label's just a, a piece of text, right? So we could go and we could put in that piece of text any HTML we want. All right? So I could do something like this. Label one dot text equals, I'm going to put an image tag, and I'm going to say src equals plus plus one thing I didn't do is, is set my alt attribute on the other. I should do that. And I can put my whoops. I can output to that text uh, or that label a string of text that consists of an image tag. All right. And I can then go and run this. And we get brown times two. And I guess to be fair to Blanchard, we'll do Blanchard a second time. I think I messed something up. Yeah, I think I did. I think I cut code when I wanted to copy code. Yeah.
So, all right, there we go. One is created with the image, one is created with the text. What's the implication of this? All right. In my mind, it's clearly better to use the image control to do this. But this does point out something that we may not have considered before. What does this point out to us? What if we returned, it a, what if we returned a list of um, students that this person advised? Also, what, what if we had another query that, that looked out, that ran out and grabbed all the students that they uh, advised? We could actually loop through that result set for students and actually construct an HTML table in a label, all right? And then when we were done, the table would appear and, and would, would, uh, would live in that, in that uh, label. So we can write any HTML we want to and pop it in a label, all right? And we can pull data from a database or dynamically create that or whatever, all right? Um, and we can just put that in a label if we want to. Now, again, is that the best approach? Nah, probably not. Sometimes, you know, typically, like in this case, I would advise to use the image uh, control because that, that was built for. But it is nice to know that if all else fails, you know, you got that to hang on to and, and you can go and you can do this. Um, folks that may have done some PHP programming will notice that this is the exact sort of way that you write PHP code, you know. Not exactly like that, but you go in and you construct your HTML via your code by taking some plain old HTML and concatenating some data maybe that you pull from a database or, or for some other place. Uh, in addition, this is pretty much like the way that we did uh, old school ASP before ASP.NET. Um, there was no framework and so you had to create all your HTML in variables like this and write it to the page. There weren't even labels to set the text for. You had to actually say, write it to the page. All right. So this is a nice little wild card that if everything else fails, you can go and you can, you can, you can do this. Now, we haven't done the update yet. All right. Um, that almost sounds like that would be a good thing for an activity on Thursday. Hmm. We'll have to see how it goes. That might be a good uh, thing to do is to try to get the uh, try to get the um, update, the actual update work, and maybe even a delete work as well. All right. So um, I'll think about that. Uh, either we'll we'll talk about that in lecture, or we'll have an activity concerning that. Are there any questions before? Yes. How is the um, under label one text? Mm -hmm. Yeah, remember that, that um, and again, there's a couple ways to do it. This is kind of the shortcut uh, way to do it. Remember that you have two sets of quotes. You have a single quote and a double quote. Uh, if you start something with a double quote, you've got to end it with a double quote. So therefore, this is, is a piece of hard-coded, it's, it's a hard-coded string that says images. Now, if I went and tried to do this, it's not going to like it because it thinks that that started the string and that ends the string. So it's not going to know what this images slash quote means. So therefore, uh, a quick and dirty, and again, there's other ways to do this, a quick and dirty uh, workaround is to put that using a single quote. So I'm using a single quote within my HTML tag. I'm using the double quotes in my ASP.NET uh, code to surround my strings. Right here. Right? Because I want SRC equals quote images slash name of the image quote. All right? This again is where, not to beat a dead horse, but this is where, in my mind, is very valuable to first think of the HTML that you want. All right? And then it, it makes coding easier. Um, it's also valuable if things don't work out the way that you'd expect them to look and see the HTML that 
excuse me, that it generated. Because, the, you know, if it isn't working the way uh, that you would hope it, obviously something about the HTML it's generating is not right. By looking at the HTML it generates, that gives you a pretty good idea of what's going wrong and how to correct it. Oftentimes it does anyhow. All right? Other questions? Let me go and upload this and we'll see you up in lab.